Hi, I'm Zoe Saldana, and I'm so pleased to be a part of the 19th Represents. Hi, I'm Meryl Streep, and I'm proud to be a part of the 19th Represents, this week of programming celebrating our voting rights centennial and the launch of this nonprofit newsroom by and for women. In this pivotal moment in history, when suffrage for so many truly remains a work in progress, let's take a look back at the voices of women who fought for all women to participate equally in our democracy. Abigail Scott Dunaway, 1834 to 1915. Excerpts from a speech at the Oregon State Women's Suffrage Association, February 11th, 1879, in Portland, Oregon. Every woman who wields a pen or elevates her voice in public whether her mission be that of teacher, preacher, actress, doctor, clerk, artist, architect, editor, or orator, is, maybe unconsciously to herself, but nonetheless surely, occupying her place in the great phalanx of figures that demonstrate mighty problems of what women can do. Some of these may be apathetic, Others may even sneer at the pioneers who are hewing the way to their success. But ignorance or injustice will make no difference in the final result. Every thinker knows, but for this woman movement, not one of these would maintain her place. And but for it, not one of them would have even secured aught. This work will go on till the victory is completed and to the end that liberty and justice may everywhere triumph over every species of tyranny and wrong. Mary Church Terrell, 1863-1954. Speech to the National American Women's Suffrage Association, February 18, 1898, Washington, D.C. When one considers the obstacles encountered by colored women in their effort to educate and cultivate themselves, since they became free, the work they have accomplished and the progress they have made will bear favorable comparison, at least with that of their more fortunate sisters, from whom the opportunity of acquiring knowledge and the means of self-culture have never been entirely withheld. Not only are colored women with ambition and aspiration handicapped on account of their sex, but they are almost everywhere baffled and mocked because of their race. Not only because they are women, but because they are colored women, our discouragement and disappointment meeting them at every turn. But in spite of the obstacles encountered, the progress made by colored women along many lines appears like a veritable miracle of modern times. They are slowly but surely making their way up to the heights wherever they can be scaled. In spite of handicaps and discouragements, they are not losing heart. In a variety of ways, they are rendering valiant service to their race, lifting as they climb, onward and upward they go, struggling and striving and hoping that the buds and the blossoms of their desires may burst into glorious fruition ere long. Seeking no favors because of their color, nor charity because of their needs, they knock at the door of justice and ask for an equal chance. Inez Milholland, 1886-1916. Excerpts from Appeal to the Women Voters of the West speech, given three months in October, 1916, to audiences in seven Western states. Soon the fight will be over, victory, is in sight, it depends upon how we stand in this coming election, united or divided, whether we shall win and whether we shall deserve to win. We have no money, no elaborate organization, no one interested in our success, except anxious-hearted women all over the country who cannot come to the battle line themselves. Here and there, in farmhouse and factory, by the fireside, in the hospital, and schoolroom, wherever women are sorrowing and working and hoping, they are praying for our success. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, 1825-1911, one of the first African-American women to be published in the United States. Speech at the 11th National Women's Rights Convention, May 1st, 1866, 
New York City, New York. I do not believe that giving the woman the ballot is immediately going to cure all the ills of life. I do not believe that white women are dewdrops just exhaled from the skies. I think that like men, they may be divided into three classes, the good, the bad, and the indifferent. The good would vote according to their convictions and principles. The bad, as dictated by prejudice or malice, and the indifferent will vote on the strongest side of the question with the winning party. You white women speak here of rights. I speak of wrongs. Let me go tomorrow morning and take my seat in one of your streetcars. I do not know that they will do it in New York, but they will in Philadelphia. And the conductor will put up his hand and stop the car rather than let me ride. Gertrude Foster Brown, 1867 to 1956. Excerpts from Recorded Remarks for Pathé, 1915. The most important question before the country today is that of women's suffrage. It is not only votes for women, but the entire question of democracy that is at stake. Ever since our government was founded, men have been proclaiming a government that should not be for the benefit of any man or class of men, but that everybody should have equal representation. Gentlemen, that is the real question in votes for women. Do you believe in democracy? Do you want a government of the people, for the people, and by the people? And aren't women people? Millions of women taxpayers are asking for the vote so that they may have representation. Women should have the vote because it would draw husbands and wives, fathers and daughters, brothers and sisters closer together, giving them an equal share and interest in important public questions. Women should have the vote because it is unjust, shameful, and just cowardly for men to deprive women of that which they demand for themselves. Mary McLeod Bethune, 1875-1955, was an American educator, stateswoman, philanthropist, humanitarian, womanist, and civil rights activist. Speech before America's Town Meeting of the Air, November 23, 1939, New York, New York. Perhaps the greatest battle is before us. The fight for a new America, fearless, free, united, morally rearmed, in which 12 million Negroes, shoulder to shoulder with their fair Americans, will strive. That this nation under God will have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, for the people, and by the people, shall not perish from the earth. This dream, this idea, this aspiration, this is what American democracy means to me. Crystal Eastman, 1881 to 1928. This is an excerpt from her Now We Can Begin speech, which was published in The Liberator in 1920 in December. What then is the matter with women? What is the problem of women's freedom? It seems to me to be this, how to arrange the world so that women can be human beings with a chance to exercise their infinitely varied gifts in infinitely varied ways, instead of being destined by the accident of their sex to one field of activity, housework and child raising. And second, if and when they choose housework and child raising, to have that occupation recognized by the world as work, requiring a definite economic reward and not merely entitling the performer to be dependent on some man. It is these outward conditions with which an organized feminist movement must concern itself.